Good morning, everyone. Early morning. I was telling Summer, if you're anywhere before noon on Sunday, then you're an early bird. So it's nice to see so many early birds. So uh, welcome to Digital Latin America. I'm assuming that almost everyone in this room has already been to something related to Digital Latin America this weekend. Yes? Good, then I'm glad to see you back. My name is Dr. Shell Sanchez. Um, I am a proud member of the 516 Advisory Board. And uh, previously, I spent 12 years at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. And now I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at uh, the New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. So some of that is how I got here. You'll have to ask Suzanne later exactly which part of that. But I'm really honored to be moderating this panel this morning because language and linguistics for me were my first kind of academic passions. And then for a long time, I've had great fascination with technology and new media in art and culture. So I love the way the discussion today is really about all of those things together. And I'm also assuming, since you guys are here on a Sunday before noon, that those are passions that you share. So um, just before I start real quickly, how many people in the audience saw the exhibit last night? How many of you have actually been through the artwork? That's great. The artists are going to take you through some of the art, so if you didn't see it last night, um, you will not be lost. So let's just start. Let me tell you who's here. I'm not going to read their bios because I know it's an educated group of people in the room, and so their bios are in front of you if you have the program. But we have with us Paula Gaetano Adi, right here, Matt Garcia, Paula Torres Nunez del Prado, and Gabriel Vanegas. And all of them have artwork that's installed um, in the 516 exhibit. And then kind of in absentia, but we're gonna give them a couple moments to speak um, through their website, is Cantoni and Crescenti, who, um, if you were in the exhibit last night, you'll recognize um, their piece, and it's also right here. This is a photograph of their piece. So they're also with us thematically and via the internet. So just to give you a little bit of intro into what we're, um, why we're talking this morning, um, I want to, I was thinking about this before I got here, and I think probably most of us in the room, and I know this because I've already seen about five or six phones up in the air taking video, is um, it's safe to assume that most of us are enthusiastic users and consumers of technology. And yet we probably share these collective concerns that many applications of communication technology are more isolating than connective. And that a great deal of technology that we've created for, for kind of connecting the masses may actually endanger the diversity of our languages and the diversity of our cultures. And for those of you who attended the keynote presentation yesterday by Pablo Helguera, he referred to the specificity of culture that only a language conveys. And for those of us that love language and love culture, that was, I thought that was a very beautifully put um, concept. Because it implies that language and culture are to a great extent symbiotic, and as we lose one, we lose the other, um, or we lose both. And also, I think more importantly, as we lose any language and any culture globally, the implication is that we reduce our capacity um, for communication and understanding, kind of, as our collective. So those are all very slightly depressing thoughts for those of us that love language and love culture. But I have to say, like, last night I was inspired and um, given hope when I went through the exhibit at 516, especially as I spent time with each of the works of art by um, the artists who are in front of you. Because these artists, along with many in the exhibit, are really using technology to engage us directly in conversations, to engage us with languages, and engage us in really interesting interactions that truly could only happen through new media and through technologies. So if you, if you went to their pieces last night or if you haven't been to really spend time with each of their works, I invite you to go back because they, through their artwork, are able to translate touch into sound 
and human speech into machine speech. They invite us to layer ourselves with native languages, create conversation between the past and the present, and if you dare, even in just language as a path to understanding. So before we get started with our artists who are in front of us, I have the not too exciting opportunity to bring up artists who are not here. Paola, can you give us a password? <laughs> oh, no problem. Okay. Okay, Paola, you're probably gonna have to come out me. This is our, this is the exciting non-planned portion. So these are the two artists from Brazil who couldn't be with us today. And this is their website, this is a, it's a video. So we're gonna let them speak to us. This is the name of their artwork, Fala, that's installed. Oops, I love language, technology, <laughs> communication. So they may or may not speak to us today. So we're gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to go and see this work, but if you did see it last night, um, essentially what you have in front of you is there's a microphone, and so as people, the interactives, they go and speak into the microphone, then the words appear and synonyms for those words appear on the screens, and then there's a whole kind of proliferation of language that goes back and forth between the person and the machines, and then the machines with each other. So it's a very interesting explanation or exploration of not just our speech, but how that translates with machines. Which maybe like 10 years or 20 years ago would have been much more um, an idea of science fiction, but as we all know now, it's actually kind of a daily part of much of our lives. I know a lot of you hang out and um, with your phones and talk to them as much as you talk to sometimes the people in your lives. So this is actually a very real exploration of what's going on with us um, as technology evolves. Okay, so that's kind of the first piece that really speaks to this issue in the exhibit. And now I'm gonna bring up Paula, and she's gonna talk to you about ingesting language. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here on a Sunday. Thank you, uh, 516, a lot for uh, organizing this amazing event. Teresa, Suzanne, Claude, Rihanna, for being great. And also, thank you, Shell, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to try to um, talk about the piece that I have here in the show. And I'm going to give you a little introduction to that. So to understand how I came to do that piece. And I'm going to introduce another piece that has to do with language, I guess, that is not in the show, but it's related to the topic here. Um, so I came to the US in 2008 um, to go to grad school to do my MFA in new media and art and technology. And I came here with a pretty um, clear agenda. agenda. By that time, I've been doing, I have been doing robotics. And I came here to just continue with that path, working on um, learning more technology, having access to technology that they have in Latin America, and um, more access to knowledge and, and all that, right? Um, and so uh, in that sense, uh, my agenda was very much related to, to the topic of, of this panel, but in a different way. Uh, my intention, I was making machines, robots or intelligent machines, with the intention of um, uh, criticizing or questioning, questioning the functionalist paradigm in artificial intelligence, questioning the Cartesian worldview of the good old fashioned artificial intelligence. If you think about this tradition in cognitive science and um, philosophy of the mind, they think of language as the way that we express intelligence. We are intelligent beings because we have a linguistic capacity, we have a linguistic behavior. If not, just think of the Turing test or think of all the Oh, that's Fala. 
<laughs> it's for Lando. It's not for Lando. Oh, how? That was, let me, let me close that. Okay, good. That was, uh, that was the scariest talking about machines, right? <laughs> So I was saying, right, this, this tradition, this functionalist tradition of thinking about the language for Turing, the language, it was our, um, the language uh, capacity function, it was what makes us intelligent. And if not, I mean, I was interested in this because if you're thinking of a social imaginaries of what is an intelligent machine, right, we always think of this robot speaking. And this is a very much a social imaginary that is stuck in our, in our head of when we think about intelligent machines. So I came to do uh, machines that can express their intelligence through the body, that could uh, establish a non-linguistic um, and body communication with the viewer. My intention is to create an interaction, rather than interaction, an encounter between a human body and a non-human body, and see what it could happen from that dialogue between these two kind of corporeality. So I'm just showing some example of this kind of work that I was doing. Um, and so, in that sense, nonverbal communication, right, bottle language, better than words, was this um, tool that I used um, in order to open up the game. Nonverbal communication has this capacity of um, open up the game to ambiguity, to, um, to a more emotional reaction, to a more emotional kind of a relationship, rather than rational or logical, right? And in that sense, I think uh, it was, I was very much interested in the possibility of non-verbal communication. Um, and um, think about all the content uh, that uh, it comes with non-verbal non communication. And there's a really wider um, set of intentional and unintentional meaning that comes along. And the signs are rather, um, needs to be like, decod like the, the coding and decoding of those signs needs to be um, done by the people that is in that particular moment, in that particular environment, and it's very much influenced by the context and all that. So this is me thinking through all the things and more in terms of uh, robotics. And I came to the US, so this is 2008, and rather than my body language or my nonverbal communication, my problem was my verbal communication. It was my linguistic capacity of expressing myself. So for those who came to learn a second language as an auto, you will know how frustrating this could be. I think there's two, mainly two kind of frustrations. One is this one of not being able to find the words, of having to accept that we're always gonna speak in the wrong way and not having the right words and having to think twice and always having this limited vocabulary where I know all these beautiful words I could say, but I don't know how to translate that. So, and there's also the frustration of not being able to be ironic or not able to make a joke. To me, that was just killing, you know? Uh, but there's also this other frustration, which is maybe a little deeper, where it's like not being able to identify myself. So there is this Paula that speaks Spanish and then this Paula that speaks English, and they cannot reconcile. Um, so in 2009, like right after, I came, like a few months after, um, I was in my studio and I had my Spanish English dictionary and I grabbed it, I cut it, the I opened it in a word, actually in the A, like the first part, I cut it the English portion and I ate it. <laughs> and it was really a very cathartic act. <laughs> that was it. It was an attempt to digest uh, the English language. It was an attempt to embody this non-native language um, with the hope that somehow it will help me. Um, and then, of course, I remember Oswald Andrade, Manifesto of uh, Anthropophaga from 1928, and it's a really beautiful manifesto about cultural cannibalism, where he says, um, it's there, uh, the best way to absorb um, the disparate and even chaotic and voluptuous reality of another culture is not really to imitate it or resist it, but to eagerly absorb it, to eat it, to swallow it whole. And he's talking in the, literally, 
right, where the Indians, um, indigenous in Brazil did with the Bishop of uh, Sardinia. <laughs> and so, you know, that was when I realized I really have to endure this action and do it every day for as long as I'm in the US. And that's what I've been doing. And um, this is the show I have here in, um, in 615, six, sorry. Um, and it's, um, if we go back to the topic of the panel, which is through new media, I don't, uh, I really don't know. I'm not sure what I could say about that. I know it relates to my practice of working with technology in the sense that I believe the language is some sort of technology, as David I will say, is a prosthetic supplement. I also believe that the dictionary is some sort of kind of technology as well. So it relates to me in that sense of technology. In terms of media, it, it could be done in another medium. This is really a performance. And video, to me, is just a tool to document, in that sense, aligns with the whole tradition of documenting an action through video that started, you know, with success and before that. So it, it really has to do with that. So in the exhibition, what you'll see is a two hour and a half uh, video. Because a portion of all those actions, I think, two hour and a half, so 79 days, 29 actions. And that's what you actually will see there. And this is like 49, I think, of those just slides. So the other piece I'm going to show that has to do with language is a rather new piece, rather different. Uh, it's called Se habla español. And oh, it's cut there, but okay. um, And I think it's different. It's different now from the other work that I've been doing in a while. And it was very much inspired by when I moved to Texas two years ago, because I've been. I see all the time this, this sign, right? This is a rather common sign in the US that indicates that someone speaks Spanish in that place. But to me, and I guess because I'm a native speaker in Spanish, this was always very odd to me. It's rather ambiguous. It doesn't tell who is the agent, who is the subject that is speaking in Spanish. It's rather wrong. I mean, it's literally not wrong, but it's confusing. And so it kept me thinking about what could be the political or, you know, what are the connotation of, of having a sign that for the sake of saving works, um, produce some sort of ambiguity of not really telling me who is the person that's speaking Spanish. If there's another intention of hiding the, the voice of who is speaking Spanish. So if you think, uh, the literal translation of Tabla Español is Spanish is spoken in English. And so there are really easy ways to fix that. Um, by if you use uh, the se habla español, if you remove the se and you replace it by the subject, then it's easy. Then you have Paula habla español, speaks Spanish, Juan speaks Spanish, or Walmart speaks Spanish, because it's used in stores, right? Um, or un latino habla español, un gringo habla español, who is speaking? Or if you don't want to do that subject, you can just replace it by adding the place, like a real indication of the context by saying here, se habla español, or in Mexico se habla español, in the US se habla español, where, where. And so this piece is a rather simple installation compound by three parts. Uh, there is a neon sculpture with the sign that I created. Um, and, um, and the intention was to give back agency to this sign. So I um, created, so I'm naming during the installation the different counties in which Spanish is spoken in the US. And then there is an audio narration of the first 1,000 uh, last names of Spanish speakers in the US, according to the US census. So this is the other part, right? In the audio, you have 1,000 last names uh, of people that identify, self identify Hispanic. And then the other is a custom software that is going through the 3,144 counties in the U.S. that at least one person speaks Spanish. <laughs> and so here there's like just, I mean, I'm just going to play it for the sake of. So this is really uh, what you hear, in a way. Going back to the talk of the new media question in the panel, I think it somehow relates to the, 
it goes along the lines of data visualization kind of project in a very different way. Um, rather than representing data, rather than doing uh, synthesis and analysis of chunk of data, set of data, and then doing a visual representation through different methods of visualization or sonification, this is a time-based work. You have to endure the data. You have to be there and listen to the 1,000 names or mm -hmm. seeing the 3,000 uh, counties right in the U.S. instead of like being this visual representation. So it was a, this little attempt to do. I mean, it's a small work in that sense. That's it. Thank you very much. They, uh, I'm going to discuss the community language space. It's a piece that is um, in the Digital Latin America exhibit. Um, I want to thank uh, 516. It's a really great experience. It's uh, real special when uh, this kind of uh, group is able to get together and I think uh, rare. So, uh, thank you. Um, so the uh, community language space uh, is a project that explores endangered indigenous languages. and. Uh, specifically to um, the American West. So initially that we started were um, maps uh, published by, the, by UNESCO um, showing the, the, uh, the world endangered languages and uh, worldwide there are uh, 2,471 based on this UNESCO maps. The U.S. has 191, the uh, west of Mississippi 153, and here in New Mexico 12. So um, and this is a uh, closer map of New Mexico. You can see this uh, cluster right here is um, in the Rio Grande Valley, which is um, home of the Pueblo people. And the black is identifying the language that is extinct. You can see in California. So um, the project started with this idea of creating a, a mediated booth <coughs> where where the urban public in the West can kind of interact with these languages um, and kind of ponder their role in an age of extinction. And that's what we have right here. And, and also play with the idea of media, social media, of the selfie of ourselves. So it's an entry point. Um, we, you know, language today is, is so much uh, about um, taking, you know, interacting with social media, the, the photo of, of oneself, the, the, uh, the, the posting to the, you know, to the social media sites. So I wanted to play with that culture and also have a conversation about what, what has been lost. And uh, uh, to, to generate this project, of course, you need partners. And this project was very much a collaboration between um, this, uh, an, an, a, a, right, a human rights group named Tewa Women United and, uh, based out of Espanol in New Mexico and, and myself. Um, it, it, wouldn't have really, it wouldn't have been possible without the, the, the generosity of this community. And um, what, what I was able to do um, was I was invited to work with the Tewa Grandmother Circle. So they have, uh, the Tewa Women United have a grandmother circle where they're, uh, the, they're using the circle to have some of the elders in the community discuss language, um, kind of collectively um, document lullabies that are being lost in Tewa, oral histories, um, educational material. Um, the issue is, is technology. I mean, they, you know, they, there's not always access or instruction on how to translate some of this stuff in, um, for the younger generations. So I was invited to work with the Tewa uh, Grandmother Circle to um, basically um, train a collection of, of the Tewa Women United community in independent media production and then also um, work on this language space. So this is just an idea of where we're at right here. This is Española right here, we see Albuquerque. This right here is the Rio Grande River, and this is kind of the head of it, the start of the Rio Grande. Um, from Taos all the way through here are um, several pueblos, and Tewas is spoken by, I think, six, and I, I have that up here. 
So um, yeah, so we have here we have six pueblos speak the Tehuatl dialect. You can see there's this is just Wikipedia, but on many sites they they say up to 1,300 people speak it. About 30 fluently um, are left speaking the language. And you see some of the numbers are very old here. <coughs> so uh, we initiated these workshops and uh, um, Tewa Women United. We hosted us. Um, we invited the community and. Much of the process was um, dialogue about media. Um, in these communities, media has been, um, is not trusted. And it is seen as a tool of colonization. And I mean, uh, working with the grandmother circle, you have uh, you know, some of the elders who were in their 60s, 70s, who, 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 were, who grew up being researched. That anthropologists, ethnographers, coming into the communities their whole lives. So, so um, the media has always been, for them, a, a, a power structure. So part of the process was to try to, um, some of the younger community in, within Table Women, Women United train them in independent production so they can control the process, so they don't have to rely on an outside researcher or, I mean, the cost of material today is so, so affordable, um, you know, they could purchase the uh, kits and we came up with kit purchases for the community. It, uh, was a learning experience because in this kind of context I could come and bring a lot of material, a lot of um, technology, but when I leave it's, it goes with me and you know, then what? So we worked on trying to, uh, we designed kits, affordable kits for the community that they, could, uh, that, that they could purchase and then I came back and we worked with the material they had, that they had uh, um, purchased. So uh, a handful of the younger uh, group at the Tewa Women United got really good at this. They, we used all open source video editing tools, open source uh, audio tools, open source image um, processing tools. So everything, the only cost was, of course, the computers. But the software, there's enough open source software out there now where you can get a lot done without having to go through um, the, you know, the expensive um, software suites. And uh, so there's a couple now, after the workshop, there's a couple uh, members of the community who now can teach the others. And, and they're the younger ones. They were really excited about it. They're really um, motivated, and the idea is now the grandmothers can go to some of the members of the Table Women United community that actually work for the organization and uh, get their stories documented and, and move forward with the, with the, the Table process, the Table language process. But in the process of the language um, workshops, we were able to document, uh, digitize a Table lullaby and several um, um, educational, uh, I guess, time-based uh, stories. I, I actually can't show those. Um, we had an agreement that, you know, I, we, we were going to come up with five words for the language box that they were comfortable sharing with you all, and that was it. So the rest of the projects we have are theirs, and, and they're, they can do what they want with them, but I'm not at um, liberty to share those. But they were really great, I can say that. <laughs> so they were amazing. Um, so then, then the media. So then, you know, here, here's the space. Um, you know, the idea is people go in, you know, having their, uh, you know, their photo booth experience. However, they're also, they're, it's mediated, so they're hearing the Tewa uh, words we came up, come, came up with. They're seeing the projections onto themselves. They take a picture. They can email it to themselves. And and I, they I debated on whether to have it mediated through social media, but. I, after talking to the community, that was a little too wired in, you know. So we felt email was a safer route. And um, when they get the email, it has a link to donate to Tewa Women United. And it has information about the organization that helped us create this group, this project. Um, it has information on uh, the language um, issues within the U.S. And um, so it's just, a, it, you know, it's, a, it's an entry point to, to, to raise awareness about this issue and then also maybe to act. I mean, you know, uh, so this is from UNESCO. Uh, they say uh, that based on their, their work, they estimate that half of the 6,000 plus languages spoken today will, be, will disappear by the end of the century. So we talk about ecological issues we face, uh, climate change. This is, in, um, based on some of UNESCO's research, this stuff is related. So as all these things change, cultures, you know, there's, in, there's endangered culture. And uh, here, and right here in the Southwest. So 
So, I mean, this isn't some global issue that you know, we're detached from. We're, we're, we're in it, especially in the Southwest. So th that's the project. If you are interested in um, doing something, participating, I would say donate money to Taylor Women United. You know? <laughs> that's what I would do. Yeah. And that's how you can help. The, this group is doing really incredible stuff. They are. These language, um, th th what we learned from the process is this is a very sensitive uh, topic for the community. Uh, to share this was a huge, huge leap of trust. And um, when this project's done, I will never share the Tewa project again. That, that it's it. It's over. So once it leaves 516, it'll go to the Tewa United for that. They'll be able to use it. But as far as the public goes, it's, it's, that's the end of the project. So um, if uh, you are interested in learning more and want to participate in doing something about it, I think uh, going to this site and finding their donation page and you know, seeing, you know, helping that way, so it, 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 that actually does help. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next we have Paola. Paola. Did you guys agree? Because there's a Paula and there's a Paula. How was that? Good day. Uh, well, uh, what I can say is that I actually come from a different background than uh, most of the people presenting pieces, I think, <laughs> uh, in the show. Uh, I'm, I've been really formed more as a formal artist. I actually come from the background of painting. And I would say, I still consider myself a painter. <laughs> I just um, do it with different media now. Um, so with this project, actually this project is the, the project that made me um, transfer from one area to the other. So it's an ongoing project. It, uh, it started in 2006. Uh, and as you can see, it's, as you will be able to see, it's very related to um, formal art, painting, and sculpture, uh, and actually to uh, more, more formal art systems, uh, the gallery system. And it started from there, really, uh, from my experience um, within this world, uh, the art world, uh, and the gallery system. Uh, so yes, as you can see, that, that this <laughs> really it's very far away from its origins by now, uh, but yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's a little slow, my computer. Yeah. So this is how the piece actually uh, looked like initially. Um, now it changed the uh, origin, the the code. So yes, this is how it, uh, well, if you have seen the piece in the art show, it sounds completely different. It's because uh, initially it was more related to a destruction of information and the code that I've used now, which is not done in maximum speed anymore, uh, actually has a structure. So then this is how uh, this started. So I was just, while I was painting, I was pondering about uh, what, uh, you know, the process behind the art system. So I took um, art politics as a model of a social, the social world. Um, and um, at the time I was uh, doing, a, well, reading a lot of hermeneutical texts. So uh, I, I started thinking out, uh, nowadays, uh, whenever you go to an art show, you expect a text next to the piece that would 
explain what is what is going on because sometimes uh, pieces are so cryptic that you cannot understand what's going on in there and you really need this sort of aid. So uh, from there, I um, thought, okay, so how can we know that really this text reflects uh, the real content of the art if it's going if it's meant to be a con to have a content at all? Uh, so. Uh, this uh, led me to think about interpretation and what is that. Uh, so I took it from the hermeneutical uh, model, which is all translation is always an interpretation, which implies the subjectivity of the one doing the, the interpretation. Right? And we can see this in text whenever we read a book that is translated from a different language. If one is able to understand both languages, the one that the book was originally written in, and the uh, translated one, there are huge differences in many cases. And uh, sometimes the property, the, say the, the lyric property of some texts are lost within this translation. And sometimes the interpreter needs to um, actually put a lot from their own, let's say, taste, so to keep this artistic property. And this can change completely, or not completely, but in a, in a big portion of the original text. So from this, um, I started thinking about perception uh, and how actually our world can be shaped but by which uh, senses we have, let's say, active. <laughs> uh, and uh, how this world is shaped through these senses. And then I started thinking about its limits, right? And that's how I... Um, uh, I don't know if you read um, the oh, oh what's going on? <laughs> uh, the Talon from Ernesto Sabato. Uh, there's a portion within this uh, short book, this book that uh, uh, basically uh, says that the, uh, or tells the story about these people uh, getting blind, but instead of, of seeing dark, it, they uh, start seeing white, a, a different type of blindness. Uh, so that this, um, this is sort of what I was thinking at the time. Uh, again, it has some time. So again, this sort of what is lost and gained within within this, this transformation. <coughs> um, so of course there uh, there is a potential power that lays upon the one doing the interpretation, which again can change. Uh, or alter the original information. This is another piece from this series. <laughs> And this is how it started, and in this way I'm connected to the next panelist. <laughs> this is a piece I did, I presented, well, an installation I sort of did in uh, Central Park in New York. And that's my connection with Briley. Uh, at the time, uh, I was very interested in Kipos. <laughs> so, um, but as we know, and as our next panelist is going to be explaining in more detail, <laughs> the code is lost. Um, so uh, at the time I was thinking, okay, I want to write a, a word within in this structure. So I thought about Braille. Okay, Kipu had the property that you read it with your fingers, with your hands. So uh, I used the system, which is, as you can see, is quite <laughs> interpreted. <laughs> but um, I left the space, let's say, to write the word vessel. And at the time, I didn't even knew how to explain why I, I, I chose this world, this word, sorry, 
Um, and I think the, this use of words is very related to trying to understand why did I have to write this word, vessel. And then, I, I mean, at this time I think it was because <coughs> I was thinking about communication and how communication can be a path, but at the same time, sort of capsule. <laughs> so I was thinking of blood vessels that can be you know, the path, but at the same time, a vessel is also a ship. And this sort of contrary between container and path. Um, so then, yes, this is again an <laughs> introduction from the next one. Um, so, yeah, this was a, a, a type of, well, it's not really, there's high speculation on the, if this is actually a writing system or not, but I decided, you know, uh, due to the Let's say the concessions one can have of being an artist, I decided to take it as uh, really being a writing system, which of course I have no proof, but again, that, that's what I decided for this very. So then, yes. The interesting thing about Braille, and I think this is uh, what made me go to this transition between formal painting and or digital art, it's actually that Braille is the first binary encoding system uh, developed by, well, officially by, um, by people, you know what, Louis Braille. Uh, so you can see this is uh, how the system works. And if you notice, all of the pieces are very, they are shaped as a painting, both of them, the one below. Ah, and, I'm sorry, the video I showed before, uh, the thing is that the, uh, I'm actually using the same system uh, in the piece that I'm showing now, although the structure is uh, so, so from the first video that I showed. So it's a merging of those two pieces, the cool needle. So this is how the autoretrato piece works. And uh, basically, it's called autoretrato or self-portrait because you are generating by touch this process. So you are sort of doing it. I mean, what it does is that it records the camera records you, and these, um, you know, each pixel is uh, interpreted with, uh, you know, with changing the frequency of a waveform, you know, so it's a sine wave. <laughs> and um, so yes. So you basically listen to your own image. Oh. That's weird. So this is a text that it's in. Oh, well, I don't know what's going on with this. <laughs> but, but yeah, basically it explained um, to the to so blind people, what, go, what was going on around them? Because obviously uh, this, piece, this piece was meant to be shown within the gallery, and it was uh, the first time that it was shown. It was surrounded by very formal art pieces, by paintings and sculptures and uh, drawings. So it was telling them what was going on that they couldn't see because none of the pieces were. They were only visual art pieces, no sound pieces or so. So then, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm not at, uh, I really uh, intend my pieces to talk by themselves because I'm not <laughs> really that cool <laughs> in verbal speech. So, but uh, actually that it's quite particular that these pieces are completely cryptic. Uh, this is a um, characteristic that I try to work on. So then, yes, thank you. <laughs> Well, good morning. How are you? <laughs> Tired? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Once again, to the 516, they did an excellent job. They are the best. And I, uh, 
thank you very much for the invitation. They are really professional work how they did and the exhibition yesterday, the opening was very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope some of you saw my piece. I won't talk too much about the piece. Uh, I will maybe talk more like the background, how I got there in a way. And I will also like to reflect upon the what is the media um, that we are using for communication. I also would like to start first with the name, I mean, we are in a symposium, and uh, the symposium actually is from the Asian Greeks, and means to drink together. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I drank last night in the opening, so I couldn't bring something to drink, but uh, that, that's the, the, the um, that's how the, the word came, and it was like a drinking party um, where you have like uh, music, uh, people drinking a lot. Also, you have like some experts who were um, kind of um, mod kind of designing the wine, how to in, in, in order to 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 depending on the discussion, if it's something seriously or if it's something like you know, depending on that, they they had these people the simple simple CR who were actually the technicians who were designing this media in order to, to, to allow the people to, to communicate themselves. <clears throat> also, I would like to maybe to reflect upon this place where we are now discussing, because I think uh, um, as our friend Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message, and for me that's very like still very profound and uh, if we see the place where we are right now it's like an isolated place it's not uh, I mean the curtains are, are closed we don't see the light we are not drinking and partying uh, we are sitting still so all is the all of these things that um, does this medium this place here is influencing also our way of, of communicating and um, so um, my background, I'm, I'm working right now, I'm doing a PhD in media archaeology in, in Berlin with Professor Siegfried Zielinski. And I'm working basically focusing into the pre-Columbian history. So before the Native Americans discovered Columbus lost in the sea in 1492. Uh, I'm focused on this story and also I'm very curious about how was the media before the colonization of, of America. So here we see Columbus uh, coming here to the sea, and also we see here some Spaniard like kind of driving these beasts and kind of uh, teaching them how to how to build their reality, their language. Here's another image from Diego de Rivera where we see how all the ancient knowledge was burned, and after that they start to teach them how to write and how to express themselves, even though it was completely opposite to their traditional way of communicating and also their traditional media of communication. Here we see how these educated um, indigenous are taught how to express and how to, to write their, their own reality. And it was also funny to see, to find these this descriptions of like flying, um, um, flying fish and, and everything. It was like a really a, a his, a big distortion of, of their reality. But it was completely opposite to the way how the, like, the native um, um, indigenous from, from America uh, used to communicate and, and the media that they used for communication. Here we see that they actually use a lot, they still use a lot this applying knowledge, like not decontextualizing, but more like working and exchanging and discussing in the place, in movement. And also we see here again um, this image where you have also always the drink. In this, in this case, is the chicha, who was also like uh, alcohol that they were using while they were working, uh, while they were exchanging knowledge and communicating. So the movement was very, very important in the way of communicating. Even though uh, Aristoteles uh, used to have like uh, the peri peripatetic school, where they used to thought about, the, uh, about philosophy, but in movement, like walking around and everything, and not sitting still like we are doing now. Um, also, the place where they used to exchange knowledge, it was not like, you know, I'm in front of you, you're kind of receiving the message, I'm a little bit higher than you. All these things, you know, influence the message that I'm transmitting. 
uh, but rather they have these places where there was a circle. If there is something in the middle, it was the fire who was lighting and warming up everything, the discussions. And um, also, this is the Maloka. It's, it's the uh, sacred place for discussions and for like partying. Actually, they're still partying. I, I had the opportunity in the Amazonas to be there, and they, you have these people with, you know, like, um, who are partying three days with children and everything, and they are just exchanging knowledge about medicine, about sacred plants. And also, again, like in the Greeks, you have this person who is like the expert who is actually producing, in this case, it's the mambe, that are coca leaves in a process that you can put in your mouth, and this will influence, will focus more your, your way of communicating. We know that alcohol, and that's why the Greeks knew about it, they mix it also with water depending on how you want to communicate. And in this case, the mambe is very efficient, it's really high technology, it's a really um, very advanced technology for communication because it really focuses you, doesn't allow you to, to, to sleep. And also you have kind of um, a link to the place where you are producing these this coca leaves. They know that they are producing in the house from some fr relatives, so you know that this medium is also like was produced for you and not from some other company or something. And also very, something very important about it is that as pa Paola, Paola, <laughs> as Paola was saying in the, in the in the beginning, like this ingesting the medium, you know, it's not something like kind of is external to you, but it's actually you are you are you know ingesting it and you kind of become the medium in a way. Um, and you see, you find the same in uh, also like the hallucinogenic like medicine, like the ayahuasca, where in order to communicate with spirits and to communicate to yourself, to the inner self, you ingest this, this high, uh, advanced technology that is the ayahuasca. Here is the um, um, Kipu Camayo, actually, they, they were the chaskis who were the Inca like uh, medium of communication. They were running up the hill uh, in movement and they were like also with the help of the kipu that is just right here, they were kind of yeah, communicating the whole, the whole Inca empire. And uh, something that interested me and that I learned a lot from indigenous communities is that we are obsessed of communicating with humans. We don't, we don't discuss how we, do we communicate with plants? How do we communicate with spirits? Why are we so focused on what, finding new ways of communicating between humans? You know, we start in the morning communicating, we go at night, we watch TV, and it's always humans, humans, humans. So how, is, how will you develop a medium of communication with other beings in this world? Here we see again this um, uh, Inca king who is drinking this medium uh, in order to communicate with the sun. So they develop really, a, they, um, they focus a lot their engineers and technicians and philosophers in order to develop ways of communicating to, with these spirits and with these animals. Even though they actually they developed their own, uh, all the Inca empire in a way that they could communicate with those spirits. This is Cusco, is in Peru, and this is the, in the middle, this is the Coricancha. It was kind of the main building from the Incas. And from this point, from this center, they wrote like some lines that are called seques. The seques are like, um, like um, a pilgrim a paths that they have to, to walk during the whole year in order to, to walk there and communicate with those spirits to, to ask them for more rain or if they want something. And they, uh, in different times of the year, they just they walk these paths and they go there and, and they party, they drink together and they kind of communicate with those other beings. So this is also one of the, the images of the Inca Empire. This is called the Diwantinsuyu, that means like four, four sides. And we also, that is very, uh, that struck me here in Albuquerque to see this image. I don't know if you have seen it, it's everywhere. This is called the Chacana. And I have seen it in the whole Andes here and also in Indonesia, it's something like, it's, it's really interesting. So I was interested in this way of communicating with other beings, so I went to Bolivia, Peru, and uh, I went to a very remote place called Cosapa, it's close to uh, 
Chile and Bolivia. And you can see, you can only see those lines through a satellite. It's not possible to see it. And they have these perfect lines that they are actually like these this pilgrim paths that they walk during the whole year. And it's also it's, uh, it's a way of communicating, but at the same time, it's also a way of uh, organizing the place where they live. So they, those lines are almost like 15 kilometer, kilometers. I don't know how to translate it to your your measurements. So this is me in that remote place, <laughs> just with just some llamas, nothing else. <laughs> uh, and they have this church in the middle of this old town. Actually, I was. They don't have like tourist people coming there, so they were kind of really impressed that I was there. Um, they just asked me, what are you doing here, here and where are you living? So, they were really <laughs> so it was really impressive to, to be there. Um, so that's, that's the image that you get when you are there, when you're not seeing from a satellite. You know, you see the yam and then you see the lines, but you cannot really tell where they are. You know, this, this is a part of the, on the environment. So it's very difficult to, to walk them because you kind of, you don't know how to follow them. It's, they are not really like, like you see from satellite, the straight lines here. They are actually part of the whole uh, environment. So the place where they are eating, the place that they, uh, give them like foods and, and everything is also, also the place, is the media that, uh, that they use to, in order to communicate with these other, other beings. This is another image church that is in the middle and if we also think about the church the church is also like a, a place for communicating with God so it is designed in a way that we can go there and communicate but in this case they drew these um, these lines so they could walk to communicate with those gods so this movement again was very important in the way of communication here we see again some images it was impressive also to see how they drew the lines. It's a big mystery. We don't really know how they drew the lines because they are really perfectly aligned with all the like west, south, and so on. So after you start walking one of those lines, after like two, three hours of walking in the middle of the desert, just with llamas and pumas around, you finally find one of, the, of these places. And this is like a secret place where you go there and they offer things and they start this communication with their gods. And it's really profound actually to walk through the desert and also you start to think about many things in a way to, to go there and, and, and have this, this profound communication with it. Of course, the Spaniards just took those places away and they just put some church on it. But we still see here some stones that they are originally, originally from the original like sacred places that they used to use. Here this is also like you get an idea of the of the lines. And it's also a question why did they had what why they wanted to, to build these perfect lines. You know, if you want to build a path you can just go through the mountains also. So why is it? And some of them they, they told me that um, they had also like a big relation with these electromagnetic fields, like also with the sun, how it's projected, it's just, just lines. So they maybe drew those lines because of that, and also with the relation of, of our body. Um, I think that's, that's one of the last images. Okay, here's another image where you can actually see how perfect they are aligned. Uh, to, to come here to here it took me like almost four hours and you were really just alone there. And as I told you, they, they, during the whole year they used to make symposiums but with drinks and they dance and everything. And they go there and discuss many things. So just to conclude, this is also well related with the kipu uh, that Paola was, was telling also that the piece that I'm showing in 516 where you have this medium of communication that is the kipu that is also related to those lines in a way, the, the sekes. Uh, there is one codex called the Codex Blas Varela where he also linked those, these two ways of communicating, the kipu and these paths of journeys that they, that they take to walk away. That's it. Thank you very much.